We are going to read today from the book of Exodus uh, in chapter 8. We learn, we have learned a great deal of uh, very important things in the book of Exodus. Uh, in chapter 7, for example, we learn that the Bible defines a prophet as someone who is a spokesman for God. When Moses uh, refused to uh, go to Egypt and to present God's message to Pharaoh, uh, his reason was that he just was too slow to speak, he, he was not eloquent, he, he, he uh, was afraid that he would badly represent God. And uh, God reminded him that he was the one who created man, created the tongue of man. He said, I'll be with you. But as uh, Moses continued to resist his role as God's messenger to, to Pharaoh, God said, well, you have a brother Aaron, and I know he can speak well. You, you go and you get Aaron to be your prophet. And so here in chapter 7, we've already learned that uh, God identified this relationship between himself and Moses as being, uh, when, he, when he got to Pharaoh, uh, since Aaron would be speaking for Moses, he says, I will put my words in your mouth and in Aaron's mouth. He says, you will be as God to Pharaoh and Aaron will be the prophet. And so uh, that's the idea. Uh, a prophet is not necessarily someone who predicts the future, although in this case we see that when God demanded that Pharaoh allow Israel to go into the desert and to offer sacrifices to God, that um, uh, it was going to be a three-day journey into the desert, um, whenever Pharaoh, whenever Pharaoh had resisted um, the the orders of God, uh, God presented to him signs as well as predictions. He warned him that uh, he would show uh, wonders to him uh, in order to prove that. The words of Moses were the words of God. He, he had him to turn his uh, rod of wood into a snake, and then uh, that snake, whenever the, the enchanters of Egypt uh, produced snakes from their rods, uh, the rod of God in, in Moses and Aaron's hand uh, ate, devoured the, the, the uh, snakes, of Egypt. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the, the sign of the water being turned to blood. The Nile was turned into blood. And uh, here we have a marvelous thing that only God could do. Now in the chapter 8, we're going to get into another series of signs that will become plagues. Now, the Nile turned to blood. That was a plague, all right, because it turned their fresh water into a liquid that they could not drink. That was a plague. But now, as we get into other plagues in chapter 8 and the chapters following, the plagues are going to be more and more oppressive to the people, and they, they could be considered as warning judgments of God they were wonders. They were displays of God's glory. But the idea was to convince Pharaoh and to convince the Egyptians of just exactly who is Jehovah, the God of Israel. And so these are the signs that we're going to anticipate here in chapter 8. I'd like us to go ahead then and to uh, read uh, from chapter 8. Uh, then... Uh, the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But uh, if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. Now there's the prediction 
You could say that was a prophecy. Uh, but nevertheless, what you have here is that uh, a th you have a judgment of God. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come upon the land of Egypt. Now, we will see that that will not be sufficient for Pharaoh it refuses uh, to respond, to submit to God's word. But uh, there's something more going on here as we notice that, that uh, God, uh, God is uh, showing his power and dominion over the created things. He's the creator. These things are the created. The Egyptians, like all of the pantheists and pagans of the world throughout history, um, they made a god out of creation. They made a god out of the things that God had created. They made gods out of the frogs as being uh, the god of fertility. Uh, Hecate, uh, the goddess of fertility, uh, was one of the Egyptian pantheon. Here we see a, a painting from the tombs of Egypt that portray uh, an image of that goddess. And um, she was the sacred symbol of fertility. Uh, we see that this god, Hecate, had no power over Jehovah God of Israel. So the thing that's important to notice here is that uh, God humbled these powers, these powers of Egypt. Now, what we're going to do is to read a little bit further at, at Pharaoh's reaction to this. The Pharaoh said to Moses and Aaron, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs may be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow, and Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord your God. Now, the important thing to notice here is that uh, God allows Pharaoh to participate, to decide just exactly when God would act. God is being very kind. He's being benevolent. He's being patient as he reasons with this tyrant. And yet, uh, God gives all men who are rebellious and sinners, he gives them time. He shows his glory. He pleads with them because God does not want anyone to perish, but for all men to come to repentance, to submit to God's will. And this is what's going on here. Um, so he said, you, you say when, and this will be the sign. You say when, and that's exactly when. It's not going to be an accident. That's exactly when this is going to happen. And he said, the frog shall go away from you and your houses, your servants, and your people, and they shall be left only in the Nile, of course, where they belong. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs, and he had, as he had agreed with the Pharaoh, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, not according to the word of the goddess Heket, not according to the word of 
Pharaoh, but according to the word of Moses, at the hour that he gave Mo, uh, the Pharaoh the privilege to announce. And, and so um, the frogs died. We're told the Lord, uh, the frogs died out of the houses, the courtyards and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Okay, they died. They are now rotting piles of frogs to remind the people, let them think about just exactly what has happened here. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart. Pharaoh did not think, he did not realize the significance of what he had witnessed. He was emotional. He was fleshly. So like so many, you let your feelings and your emotions rule you, and you let your flesh tell you what you want, and you've got your pride, and you've got this, and you've got that. And you're going to make a fool of yourself, just like Pharaoh did in this case. He would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. God had predicted this about him. So, right away, we have the third plague of the gnats. They come right away because, obviously, Pharaoh did not obey the voice of God. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts, all right. They had their enchantment. They had their mysterious arts. They were famous the world over for their wisdom in the practice of their secret arts. And they've been able with their arts to duplicate to some degree um, the wonders of God and with the snakes and, and with the, the, the water turned to blood. But when it came to this one, right away, or with the frogs, but now with this one, uh, they, they don't have any, any well-trained gnats <laughs> or lice, whatever they might have been. Uh, some of these uh, Hebrew words are a little bit difficult to, to nail down. Uh, we're told, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. They knew the difference, and they told Pharaoh the truth. This was not an enchantment. This was not one of Moses and Aaron's tricks that was maybe a superior enchantment to what the, the uh, uh, magicians of Egypt could do. Imagine having these men come out of the desert and being wiser than the magicians or the, or the wisest of the men of the earth according to the way they were thinking. What the fact was, this was not an act of Moses and Aaron. It was an act of God. He says, that they say, therefore, this is the finger of God. They're beginning to know Jehovah God of Israel. But it didn't help Pharaoh. He didn't listen even to his own magicians. He says his heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Let's take a look here at uh, the significance of this uh, particular plague. Uh, the Egyptians had another God by the name of Geb, uh, the Egyptian god of the dust or of the, of the earth. And here we have one of the paintings of the Egyptians, uh, the typical style uh, of their, their, uh, their two-dimensional way of, uh, it was kind of a, um, a religious uh, kind of painting uh, of their god that they believed had dominion over the earth, the, the dust of the earth. But now God, using the dust of the earth to produce this lice or this, um, uh, the gnats, whatever they were, uh, Jehovah God of Israel declared his dominion over the Egyptian God of the earth named Geb. So uh, we are learning more and more. The Egyptians are learning more and more about the power and the dominion of God. 
So right away, we have a fourth plague because the Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not respond to God. God has said, I will harden his heart, but we can see how he did it. He, he presented plagues that specifically challenged the religious faith and beliefs of the Egyptians. It, it challenged the authority of, say, of, this, of the Pharaoh himself. And he was offended by that. He got his feelings hurt. Many people reading the Bible get their feelings hurt. And they harden their hearts and they will not submit to the, to the authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there are consequences as there were in the case of this Egyptian Pharaoh. Now a fourth plague, a plague of the flies. The Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh and as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people Tomorrow this sign shall happen, and the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and, in, and into uh, his servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt, and the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Well, what we see in all of this picture is Swarms of flies, the word flies here, again, it's an insect, uh, a member of the insect world. Uh, the word swarms, or it's also translated as many kinds of flies, many kinds of insects. The, the insect that was worshipped uh, was the scarab, and we have many drawings of of insects that were sacred to the Egyptian people. Now remember, they worshipped uh, their the creation of God, their, their natural world. They were environmentalists. They worshipped their their uh, environment, the earth, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of the created beings. Now uh, that was the that was the affliction that God sent upon all of the people. But in this case, God put a, di a difference. If you can imagine swarms of insects crawling on everything and getting into everything, and yet in this one little region of Egypt in Goshen, there at the mouth of the uh, Nile River, nothing. Here you don't find, you don't find anything but uh, but peace and tranquility and normality in the lives of the Israelites. Uh, we need to understand that this sign of God, uh, by its nature, this sign of God in Egypt was designed to impress the people that God was, had chosen the Israelites and had set them apart from the Egyptians. And uh, the, the whole drama began when Pharaoh was going out to the river and they had their daily ritual of washing and cleansing and, and they, he, they're showing just how holy and pure and righteous they are uh, by this ritual. And so many people do that. They've got their symbolic things they do to declare how pure they are, but the fact is they are not. And the fact that they keep washing themselves ritually every day reflects that in their consciences they know they were living filthy, immoral lives. And they were. They were living terrible lives and they were suffering terrible diseases. In this case, God is afflicting them and showing them who they are and what they really are. 
in uh, in this uh, this scene of um, uh, the uh, God of the flies or of the scarabs. Uh, here you see a, a drawing, a painting there in the tombs of Egypt uh, of the God who was the God of, of the flies, the scarabs, uh, Capri, I, I suppose you pronounce that, with a head of an insect. Um, that was, uh, that was a very important part of the pantheon of the Egyptians. And here, the insects are not under the authority of the Egyptians or their gods, but under the authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, let's continue reading now just for a moment. Uh, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. Now, he's making an, a concession. Okay, you can go, but only within the land. Uh, Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? Uh, you remember that from, even from, from the times of Joseph, the Egyptians had a, a very low opinion of people who cared for livestock, and they worshipped, like the Indian people and uh, the nation of India, uh, the Hindus, uh, they worshipped the cattle. Uh, they didn't eat them. They didn't offer them in sacrifice. That would be an abomination to them. And yet God commanded them to offer sacrifices of animals and especially of the cattle. And that was what God had commanded them. And if they were to do that among the Egyptians, they would be outraged and it would be a riot. Moses says, we must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Okay, Moses says, we've got to obey the Lord. And you do too, Pharaoh. You've got to obey the voice of God or there will be dire consequences. And this is what Pharaoh is learning little by little. He says, I will let you go to sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away and plead for me. Uh, Pharaoh knows he's defeated at this moment, at least. He's dealing with all of this plague of the sacred insects, which they could not even kill. They couldn't mistreat or abuse because they believed they were sacred. Then Moses said, Behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. I like that way that's translated in the ESV. Uh, now, Pharaoh, don't you even think about cheating on the Lord, that is, not doing what you say you're going to do. The Lord's going to give you relief. And I tell you what, I, I can remember I can remember praying for people in the hospital who were in very critical condition and hearing them make me all kinds of promises. If the Lord just heals me, if he gives me a second chance, I will become a Christian and I will serve the rest of my life with all of my heart. And, and then the Lord hears our prayer and he gets well. And then what happens after he gets home from the hospital? That's the last that you see of him. <clears throat> Here is what Pharaoh is being warned about. Moses says, I will plead for the Lord, to the Lord for you, but just don't think about uh, cheating on the Lord by not letting the people go sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did, as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of the flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people 
go. Is that not a remarkable thing to read about? We learn a lot about ourselves and about our relationship with God by just watching Pharaoh and watching the Egyptians and listening to the words of the prophet of God. I hope and pray that these words will be useful to you and that you will learn, as I have, uh, the powerful lessons from the book of Exodus. And may God bless you.